I'm so glad to welcome you here to the Clark Howard Show. Our mission is to serve you and empower you so you make better financial decisions in your life. In this episode, I'm going to start out with something that has been so controversial for years, real estate agent commissions. There's a big fight going on right now about them, and we have the results of our own poll to share with you later I'm going to talk about two different things that have been really expensive that are now coming down in price, which is great for your and my wallet. So speaking of wallet, wow, real estate commissions in the United States are perhaps the world's highest. It is very unusual the level of real estate commission We pay in the United States when you hire an agent to sell your home for you, is what's known as the listing agent in most states. And then you have the buyer's representative. And I've talked in the past that if you are doing a for sale by owner, you really need to consider doing agents protected on commission if somebody brings you a buyer, because otherwise they're going to steer past you. If they know if they took a buyer to you that they're going to make no money for doing so. But the commission level in the United States remains uh, pretty high. I mean, it was typically around the country right around 7%. Now the average around the country is a little under 6 uh, As I said, much higher than and other countries. The, uh, the industry has had uh, great success at maintaining much higher fees than in other places for a number of reasons, some political, some cultural. But it was interesting because we did a poll at Clark.com to see how you felt about real estate commissions. And we got, not only did we get a lot of votes on it, but the other thing we got was we got a lot of very, very strong comments. So we have nearly half of people, 48% to be exact, who would try to sell on their own first. And then we have people who say they're only going to do for sale by owner that represent 30% of sellers. Those who would always use a real estate agent, 23%. So overwhelmingly, uh, three quarters of people in our survey that is not scientific, you know, we didn't have, uh, we didn't have Gallup or somebody like that doing randomized samples from around the country, plus or minus 3%. This was one where we asked for your response and received it. But the reality is it means clearly there's frustration about what these commissions are and people would really like to at least try to sell a home themselves first. I want to tell you, real estate agents have remained successful in the marketplace because it's worked. Real estate agents have been able to come into a situation not have emotion involved because we get really emotional about selling our own home. Uh, They come in, they look at it as a business transaction. They use market surveys to come up with a price, blah, blah, blah. And so real estate agents are so dominant in the marketplace because it has been a successful business, but at very high cost to you selling a home. Who does it work well for, though, if you're willing to take on the work and be a merchant, and I'm going to explain what that means, being a merchant ahead, being a merchant, being realistic about the price, it works best for people generally in suburban neighborhoods where there's some uniformity in a large neighborhood, home to home, and it's pretty clear what fair market value on a home would be. 
if it's in an uh, example an older area where each individual home in a neighborhood is different it is very hard as an individual who is not a real estate professional, it's not even easy for a real estate professional to establish what would be fair market value for that home. But in a large suburban development, with uh, particularly with the big developments from the publicly traded builders where they build uh, hundreds, even thousands of homes in an area, usually with four to six building plans, there's so much uniformity and what's being built that when you go to sell if you want to try to sell yourself first like we had nearly half of people who said they wanted to it is possible that you could establish uh, what would be a reasonable fair market price put it on the market but let's go back to that merchant thing you have work to do you have work to do you have to have good professional photographs done of your home. You need your most negative friend to come and look at the home and say, ooh, you know, house really needs paint really badly. Do you realize nobody's going to like that color? I love that color you painted in the living room, but no buyer's going to like that. I mean, neutral tones, you always hear that from a real estate agent. You don't want to be too far out there, no matter how creative or artsy it is. And if somebody comes in your home to see it, and they start talking about how ugly your furniture is or whatever, they're forgetting it's your home they're seeing. Do not ever be offended. And if you do reach a point where it looks like somebody's going to make an offer, what you're really missing is some of the expertise real estate agents have in dealing with the minute details that can cause a deal to blow up. So as an alternative, I like for you at a much lower cost, if you're able to find your own buyer for your home, to have a real estate lawyer draw up the sales contract between you and the buyer because you don't want to think you've sold the home you're it's off the market now and then the deal blows up because you did something with some fill in the blank sales contract you want that done right and let me go back one thing Krista it's the whole idea of why it is so important that when you are selling a home you do what 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 is a missing element when you're going to sell a home? Uh, oh, gosh. I hate it when you quiz you, me on the spot. I know, but you you bought and sold so many I mean, homes. I was what I was just thinking about was, and some of our poll respondents made notes about this, that there are different disclosures you have to do in different states. And so the legalities do wor- would really worry me. And that's why the real estate age, the real estate lawyer right. is so important. But I'm guessing what you mean is put, make sure the home's in the MLS and that you're protecting buyer's agents. Thank you. Thank you. That is <laughs> so very important because paying out half a loaf or part of a loaf is much more important than paying nothing and having no buyer. Because even if you're not jazzed about real estate agents, most buyers are going to have a real estate agent and they are not going to know about your house if you do not commission protect. You should say in your listing, buyer's agents protected or something equivalent so that it is clear that you will commission them at 2% or 3% because, yeah, I'm now saying you're getting 98 cents on the dollar or 97 cents on the dollar, but you're getting all those dollars because that buyer's agent brought you someone. Okay, we'll go to some questions. This one is from Michael in Colorado. My wife and I will both be retired in three years. We live in a mountain home in Colorado, but we have rental property in Arizona, our former residence. 
At retirement, we would like to claim the Arizona home as our primary residence again for two years to sell it afterwards without capital gains and recaptured depreciation. The Colorado home would become our vacation home for those two years. We plan an RV on RV traveling a lot and won't spend a lot of actual time in the Arizona home. How do we make sure we qualify the Arizona home as primary residence for those two years? With utility bills, do we need to change our driver's licenses and vehicle registration to Arizona, etc.? We will want to return to the Colorado home as our primary residence after. So this is something people do try to figure out how to do repeatedly is to get the advantage of the two fifty or five hundred thousand um, dollar owner exemption for sale of a property where you don't pay the capital gains. So uh, you already know you need to spend two years in that property, two of the last five, in order to sell it. I think you do everything you can that's a check mark that shows that that's now your primary residence. And yes, I would go through the hassle because the money at stake is so large. Going back to Arizona driver's licenses, vehicle registrations, everything you can to make it clear you live there. Now, if you were ever challenged, and you're talking about you'd be traveling in an RV all the time, and in an audit they were ever trying to say that was not a valid personal residence, what would count against you is you would not be able to clearly demonstrate nights in Arizona in those two years. If you're constantly on the road in the RV, and you're really not spending much time in Arizona, possible you'd be challenged on it. But if you set it up as your principal residence, you have your bills go there, your driver's licenses are there, your vehicle tags are there, or plates, whatever you prefer, um, then you have reestablished residency for those two years. You will have, the way you set it, I'm not sure... If you follow, you will pay uh, depreciation tax. You know, if you've depreciated, you're going to pay 25% tax on the portion of the home you've depreciated, but the remainder will be subject to the exemption, the quarter million or 500,000. So you can do it, but it's not a completely free lunch because if you've been depreciating the property as an investment property, you will have recapture tax at the time of sale. And then when you're there, we have a friend who would like buy a coffee every day. You do something where you have receipts from being in the state, Yeah, right? okay, I'll tell you, um, this has been a big issue with people who, for example, since COVID, have moved from uh, the Northeast or the Midwest to Florida or Arizona or whatever, but they're living in both places. They have a uh, Florida credit card or an Arizona credit card or a Texas credit card, and every day they do something by rote that shows they woke up that day in that state, and it's got to be past 183 days um, for you to be clear on that prior state not coming after you. Okay, and Michael in Indiana says, I had ordered a desk from Amazon Marketplace from one of their sellers, and weeks later I got a postcard from the seller. In exchange for a five-star review, they would give me a $20 Amazon gift card. I can send you the photos if needed. Yeah, Michael, Amazon says this disqualifies a seller, blah, 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 blah. This gaming goes on repeatedly. When you buy from third-party sellers on Amazon, I assume you get these offers? Yeah, rarely buy from third party, but when I have, I've gotten a couple offers, never taken advantage though. So that's really interesting because you and your husband are power buyers on Amazon. (laughs) I mean, you got that reserved space for Mm -hmm. the Amazon truck and 70 or so percent of stuff being sold on Amazon is third party. Mm -hmm. But the things you and Mike buy um, that you have this reserved space for the truck (laughs) Um, you're buying not third party. They're the small percent of items Mostly. that are all Amazon. Mostly, yeah. So we don't That's get those That's really offers. interesting yeah. because when I buy from Amazon, it's almost always third party because, mm. you know, I'm so price oriented. I'm looking what Walmart.com has and Amazon and eBay and all that. So I'm getting this thing Michael's getting frequently where they say for a review, you get this, you got that, you got the other. 
And uh, that is not cool. It's why I always say you need to read reviews, not look at stars to see what people really think, not what they're posting with a star level or this was the greatest thing ever, you know. Gorin in Georgia says, I'm a 23-year-old and have had my car for the last few years. I got it used at around 17,000 miles and have been taking it to the dealership for routine servicing every 10,000 miles, which they recommend. I'm now closing approx- closely approaching 60,000 miles, and I was wondering if this is something that I should continue to do, or is it a play by car manufacturers to take more of my money than is necessary for routine maintenance? Thanks for everything you do. All right, so Gorin, uh, first of all, your buy the book classic the way you buy a vehicle you bought one that was one to two years old seventeen thousand miles on it so the first buyer ate a lot of the depreciation now you've got sixty thousand miles on it you are depreciating the vehicle at a lower scale because you started off with a vehicle that somebody else took that first depreciation hit you're doing maintenance as asked or required. And it's great you're doing the maintenance, but you don't have to do it at the dealer. For most any brand now, there are independent shops that specialize in your brand or a small number of brands. Yours is a European make. There are shops that specialize in individual European makes or a group of European makes. You're going to find that these shops are going to be smaller than the dealer they tend to uh, you tend to be able to establish more of a personal relationship with the place and the prices may not necessarily be significantly lower than the dealer but i think there's more accountability and i think overall you'll have a better repair and service experience and maintenance experience at the independent shops but maintenance If you're trying to get good, good, good life out of this vehicle, following a regular maintenance schedule is invaluable. Coming up ahead, I want to talk to you about where we had all the escalation in so many prices. Now, in so many areas of the economy, prices are coming down. And I got some in particular I want to share with you where your dollar is going much further today. It's been a a big theme over the last probably about 18 months that Americans and also in other countries as well, the people have gone through this big rotation, that they've gone from buying stuff to buying experiences. And it was absolutely true. I've talked about how the, the prices of stuff have come down so much that that during COVID, when people were locked up, they were buying all kinds of things for their homes. I remember the questions we were getting one after another about, how do I get a pool put in my yard? Nobody will even call me back. Well, today, let me tell you, the pool companies are soliciting customers because they went from being the most in demand of like anything out there during 20 and 21 to now they're like, hey, what about us? What about us? Wouldn't you like a nice pool? So the market has shifted so heavily and so strong. I mean, it was just clear as could be that uh, people who sold things that owned the market for two years suddenly were stuck with inventory and they were trying to lure in buyers. I talked recently about TVs and what an unbelievable deal electronics are right now because people went from craving them to saying, who needs that? Well, now it seems that a lot of that pent-up demand for services that ran prices up in 22 and this far in 23 is running out of steam. And so not only is stuff a deal, but experiences are starting to become not as bad a deal as they were. An example, amusement parks. You know, things like uh, Universal, Disney, 
and then regional amusement parks. When people started getting out and about in huge numbers in 22, and obviously this year, there was all this pent-up demand, and the amusement parks use dynamic demand pricing now, where the prices, as demand rises, the prices go way up till you run out of room or run out of people. Well, now what works so badly against us now is going the other way. I saw an item in the Wall Street Journal about how the amusement park attendance is down at the Universal Parks and the Disney Parks. And what's following? The prices are coming down. You're going to find the hotels. If you go to Central Florida, the hotels that have been so expensive are now becoming more affordable. The daily admission costs, more affordable. And if you're planning a fall trip, fall is always a down cycle on attendance and cost at the parks. This fall, the decline is going to be greater than normal. Airfares have clearly started a trend downward. And I'm seeing much better offers on fares as I look into the fall. And again, this is a repeat pattern. Fall airfare travel for leisure travelers is much cheaper than summer. But what I'm seeing starting to pop up is deals for starting after Labor Day. The fares are significantly lower than the normal seasonal shift would call for. Americans have been out there, they've done it, been there, done that kind of thing. So now some of that pent-up demand has been released and we're moving into more normalized cycles. And that means you're going to find better deals. The inflation reports have obviously been getting better. It's not a straight trend line down, though. You'll find monthly reports will have a certain wave effect. Some months, will inflation will be higher than expected. Some months, it'll be lower than expected, as it was last month. We'll have that, but the trend is our friend with us not having to chase steadily rising prices. On that positive note, Krista... <laughs> And the, oh, who's the negative for? People who own those businesses. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. the profits they're going to be able to report that have been so bonkers large, mm-hmm. those may normalize as well. But for you and me as consumers, the price of stuff is and experiences both getting better. Yeah. Still haven't replaced my fence. Maybe it'll be time soon. Well, think about it this way. As soon as you put in a fence it starts depreciating, meaning that that fence, you know, has a lifespan, it deteriorates over time. The fact that you've had to wait two more years than you expected basically is a discount in and of itself. Mm -hmm. True. All right. Alyssa in Ohio says, I keep receiving letters and emails from my gas company using financial scare tactics to convince me to purchase gas line plus protection plan. I've been a homeowner for 16 years, and this is the first time I've heard of this protection. Seems fishy. Please advise. Yeah. So this is all the thing. Water line protection, gas line protection, 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 uh, surge protection from the power company. They're all trying to sell you uh, subscriptions that have profit margins that are shocking. Like these various protection plans apparently have profit margins above 90% for the utility companies or the third parties they contract with. If you have municipal water, you'll find that your local government is in cahoots with some third-party water service line protection plan seller where the city is trying to con you into getting it. So the city gets a commission and they charge you way too much for this protection. Uh, We have an article on this at Clark.com to help you think through the dollars and cents and see if it makes sense for you. When do I buy any of these things? Never, never, 
not ever. And that the title of that article just written by Ruthie on our team is what is service line insurance if you're looking for it on clark.com. Karen in Pennsylvania says, Clark, I recently set up auto pay with a company that was directed to debit my checking account on a specific date. However, without my knowledge, they requested payment from my bank three days earlier than scheduled and they were paid. When I reached out to my bank because I was charged an overdraft fee, I was told this is common. Clark, how can this be permissible? So, Karen, ACH does not have normal consumer protections. When you set up a uh, direct debit from your account from any company, it could be whoever it is, they, they say it would be so convenient for you and you'd never miss a payment if you set up an automatic debit. It comes under industry rules that were designed by industry for industry with no consumer protection angle at all through ACH, Automated Clearinghouse. Now, whenever I've said this in the past, uh, we tend to get communications from the ACH people saying, I'm not being fair, I'm not telling the whole story. Well, tell me, what is the other story? Because there hadn't been one that I know of. So when you set up an automatic debit, it says in the terms and conditions that there are circumstances where they will debit you early. Um, most common example, the payment due date might fall on a Sunday or a Monday that's a holiday. And they say, you know, you understand and accept or whatever lingo the lawyers wrote that your payment will occur early in those circumstances. It is. It would be unusual if they debited you early in something that was not a calendar or holiday issue, but it's something you have to know that if you set up ACH. My preference is that you set up bill pay with your own financial institution. Uh, almost 100% of the time, that's free. It will be paid electronically, but on your terms and conditions. You set the date the payment goes, and that is the date it will go. If if let's say you set up a payment date on a holiday or a Sunday or something like that, you will then get a notice from your own bill pay service saying, uh, we're planning to make this payment three days earlier because Monday's a holiday or something like that. And you can then change the payment date, let's say to that following Tuesday so that it doesn't come out early because your original payment date selected was a Monday or Sunday or something like that. So that's why I don't like ACH, is it is a stack deck against you as a consumer. And George in Texas says, I heard a listener on the podcast questioning recalled strawberries. Perhaps you have discussed this in the past, but your listeners can get product recall emails from several government agencies, such as the FDA, USDA, Consumer Products, and NHTSA. To sign up, go to recalls.gov. That is a great suggestion. I've talked about recalls.gov on television. I don't think we've ever done that on the podcast. Mm, not, not for a while, anyway. So I thank you very much, George, for saying that. And Krista, do you know what my favorite fruit or vegetable is by far and away? The fruit or vegetable? Come on, to give me a, a visit of fruit or a vegetable. Well, it's tomatoes. So oh, that's okay, kind of a okay. fruit and a vegetable at mm -hmm. the same time. Got is it. that right? Tomatoes, yes, yes. Yeah. I think technically they're a fruit, but yeah. But they're like a vegetable. Yes, I count them as a vegetable. I, <laughs> I don't know a, why. <laughs> I was at a doctor the other way, other day, and because of something we're monitoring with me, he said, I can't eat tomatoes anymore. <gasps> oh, no. I'm crushed. I'm sorry. That's Because they're good. really acidic. Yes, yeah. Oh, so then I'm not going to have to worry about recalls on tomatoes oh. anymore because I can't eat them. It's kind of a crushing blow. For that me. is crushing. That yeah. would crush me too. I love a tomato. That's a bummer. Because you've seen me, I'll eat, I'll eat a bowl of just tomatoes and cucumbers. Oh, yeah. Which are so good for so you. So cucumbers, is that a fruit no, or a vegetable? No, that's a vegetable and that's good. Okay. Yeah. All right. So uh, um, you see my nutrition knowledge. I mean, I is admit, somebody will zero. probably write in and say I'm wrong about that, but that's okay. Well, let's look at it this way. They're good for you. 
Yeah. All right. Well, we want to be good for your wallet. And that's why what we're devoted to is giving you ideas to save more and spend less and avoid getting ripped off. And I want you to think about one of the things you'll hear from me as a theme day by day, week by week, year by year. I forgot to say month by month. Is the idea of zigging when others are zagging. Like what I was talking about with these things are a deal now and before they were really expensive. I want you to have a heads up when opportunity arises for you as an investor, as a saver, as someone buying stuff, whatever it is that you understand the patterns of the wider economy and how it affects your wallet to help you make decisions that you can act on in your life. Have a great day.